Hi, my name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. This podcast is brought to you by School for the Dogs, a Manhattan-based facility I own and operate along with some of the city's finest dog trainers. During this podcast, we'll be answering your questions, geeking out on animal behavior, discussing pet trends, and interviewing industry experts. Welcome to School for the Dogs podcast. This week, School for the Dogs podcast is sponsored by SaneBox, the email service that is designed to make dealing with email a breeze. SaneBox gives you a powerful set of tools that can work in just about any email client. It's kind of like artificial intelligence for your inbox. SaneBox will automatically sort your email for you, defer your email to a more convenient time, set up reminders, and more. Get a two-week free trial plus $15 off when you sign up at schoolforthedogs.com slash sane. Today I'm speaking to a very famous baby. Well, of course, she's not a baby anymore. She is a woman in her 70s. The story of her babyhood has become something of an urban legend. And the misunderstandings about her youth, I think, actually dovetail with a lot of misunderstandings about dog training. Deborah Buzan is an artist. She lives in England, and I have to say we spoke via Skype. We did not have a great connection. This recording is not wonderful. I did my best to clean it up, but um, even if it's not the, the most easy listening, I hope you will make it through this episode because we had a really interesting conversation. She is the daughter of B.F. Skinner, and if you've listened to this podcast before, you've probably heard me talk about B.F. Skinner. He is one of my heroes and a hero to many good dog trainers out there. Skinner, who sadly passed away in the early 1990s, is considered to be one of the founders of the science of behavior, and he codified a lot of what we know about the science and philosophy of behaviorism. If you're not familiar with Skinner, I suggest going out and getting all of his books, or at least one of them, about behaviorism is a good one to start with, or Beyond Freedom and Dignity. He also wrote a novel called Walden 2, which is kind of about how you could create a utopia using positive reinforcement. Anyway, I thought the best way to introduce Deborah would be with this clip of her father discussing some of the misunderstandings about how she was raised. Well, I'd like to correct some, some rumors that, uh, that go around. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure that some of you have heard them. Um, uh, the distinguished psychiatrist, whose name you all know, I won't mention it, uh, told a distinguished person, whose name you also would know, that the child that we raised in the so-called box, the air crib, became psychotic. I uh, wrote to him, I said, we've heard this before, and I've often wondered where it came from. Would you mind telling me? where you heard this rumor. My daughter is, uh, our daughter is uh, very intelligent, talented, married. Her husband teaches international studies at the University of Warwick. They live in London in London Spa. My daughter is a very successful artist. She does large colored etchings and sells all she can produce and so on. Uh, I don't see any ill effects of the, uh, of the uh, crib on her. Well, he wrote a very apologetic letter, I must say that. He didn't tell me where he heard it. Um, but then uh, one summer, uh, a British critic came over and uh, said to a friend of ours, who and a professor of literature at Harvard, isn't it too bad about that uh, daughter of the Skinners they raised in the box killing herself? <laughs> and uh, our friend said, well, well, when did she do that? I was swimming with her yesterday. <laughs> but recently I've been getting letters. I've had two or three in the last month. Is it true that your daughter is suing you? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, um, I wish to say, um, that's the daughter which is not here. I can't put her on display, but uh, um, she, um, she's not suing me. We have a very good relationship. Hello, my baby. Hello, my baby. I was born Deborah Skinner, and I am a printmaker, and I also do writing. And my father was B.F. Skinner, and he was a 
behavioral psychologist Harvard. He was studying rats and pigeons, which are an awful lot simpler than human beings, in order to learn about human behavior, because humans definitely have the same sorts of reactions to their environment. He used a term called operant conditioning. Right, and I explained to people operant conditioning, if I understand correctly, he called it that because the animal is operating on his environment in order to produce some kind of change. Would you say that's a, a, a definition? That's right. Of? And my father was very, very badly misunderstood about that because a lot of people assumed that he wanted to control an awful lot about daily life. He used the word control an awful lot, uh, which I don't think was very wise because it's a kind of a dirty word. But what he was talking about was creating your surra surroundings so that you are a lot happier. He wanted the science of behavior to help that, not in society into, he didn't want to become a despot that decided what people were going to do. Right, but to me it always seems that we are controlled a lot more than we like to think about. I mean, just something as simple as taxes, right? I, I pay taxes because I understand if I don't do it, the consequences are not going to be good. And if I don't do it for long enough, I'll be put in a, <laughs> in a, in a small box with a guard somewhere. Isn't that control? We are already controlled. We are controlled by traffic lights. You know, we're controlled by, controlled by uh, laws that our children go to school our dogs to be on leashes, you know, there are lots of laws that we're controlled by. We're controlled by the police. And he was saying, should set up things so that we are not having to be ruled controls that we don't like. And this doesn't mean remove traffic lights. This means set up things more positively. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think, I think the main thing is just that controlled by rules and law, but we're not controlled Right way. An awful lot of it is very aversive. So we are punished. Right. Aversive and also coercive. But a lot of the time, I mean, I think behaviors are generally encouraged with us via negative reinforcement where something is being taken away in order to encourage a behavior rather than a behavior being reinforced with rewards. I, I think what, what he was saying was that if like the government is going to control us, which they are, they should be manipulating us by making the things they want us to do really reinforcing. So they should be fun, like rewarding us for driving the speed limit rather than waiting for us to go over it and then punishing us. There should be much more in terms of reward. He's, he's often, he's, um, he's thinking for the good of people. Just this, just this morning, my husband said to me, do you think people used to, I was telling him about Old, some old school dog training methods that, of course, still persist, um, but things that I think are are pretty ridiculous. And he said, do you think people like forcing their dogs to do things because it relates to the way they it feels good to, to control something that you feel like is less than you? Uh, and I said, yeah, I think that relates to it because we're controlled so much and we learn to do things because of aversives, and so therefore it's natural that... I certainly can believe that there's the idea of dominating a dog gives you certain pleasure, and training, for instance, is terrific because, you know, you've got the animal to do what you want even though they doesn't understand whatever language you speak, you know. It's a kind of a satisfaction that you get from that. I certainly get it. My cat sit up and roll over and play the piano Right when you're training with when you're training with me. right training with positive reinforcement that way and certainly shaping it's, it feels very magical. Yes, isn't it? It's wonderful. I'm curious if your father was a good dog trainer. Did you have any pets in your home? We had a dog, a beagle. Hunter was allowed to go out and roam. My mother would open the door and let him out, and then again she'd have to go and open the door. And she was getting very fed up with it, just like a servant for a, you know, a princess or something, standing at the door waiting for, <laughs> for the dog to want to come in. My father took a, um, a piece of cardboard and he 
drew a spot on it, and underneath it said, Hunter, you can't come in. And he put this next to the front door. There's a, a picture window there, so Hunter could see it. And no matter how hard Hunter tried to get in the front door, she wouldn't let him in. So when the card was in the window saying, Hunter, you cannot come in, the heart, even if he tried very hard, he couldn't come in? When the card was in the window, I don't know if he, I don't think he barked, I think he whined, she wouldn't let him in, being good, I think. Um, she would take it away, and then the minute he asked to come in, she let him in. So it did not take him very long. He was an intelligent dog, I like to think. So I had all these friends who thought he could read. But uh, it was That's very a great funny story. because he, he, he learned very quickly that it was no point in asking. So he'd go run around again or whatever and come back, sit very, very patiently until she removed the spot and then immediately let, it, let him in next time he... And then occasionally, uh, as he was getting older, probably, he, was be, he would go to be asked to be let out, and she would go to the cupboard where the piece of cardboard was kept, and he would look at her with this cardboard in her hand and think, you could see him thinking, uh, maybe I don't want to go out now, <laughs> because he, he knew it would be a long time before he'd be let back in again. Well, so this actually is a good segue into something else he did that, that apparently was to help your mother, which is to build uh, what he called the the baby tender. Is that right? It also was called air conditioner, H-E-I-R conditioner, hair, air conditioner. Which is pretty funny. Which I think is a good name, but not used really. It was, that was just a joke. But it was mainly called um, the baby box or the air crib. But baby box is bad because, of course, box goes back to what my father was doing with rats and pigeons, which was putting them in a box. Of course, and there were all sorts of uh, horrible rumors about me. and It was terribly bad because it reflected badly on him. But hold on, just, just, let's just, his, just to back up for a yeah. moment. You say he was putting them in a box, but for people who aren't that familiar with his work, it might sound nefarious. Really, he was putting them in a box, well, from what I understand, to uh, to very narrowly control their environments and encourage certain behaviors that he could then train yes. using, punish, using uh, well, reinforcement, really, right? So, I'll, I'll just say um, he was putting them in a box to study their behavior right. when he was doing experiments on our behavior. And, but that was called the Skinner box. And when he put me in it, I wasn't actually an experimental subject at all. The whole reason that he decided it would be a good idea to have an enclosed box with glass in front and behind um, was that it was a much nicer environment for the baby. The... The reason that my father decided there was a better way than a crib with bars and small and having to wrap a baby up in was um, that when my sister was born, my mother was very happy to give birth to a baby. She was very happy for that, but she didn't really like all the business of having to change diapers and having all the sheets and clothes and everything had to wash all the time. She, she was, I suppose you could say she wasn't that domesticated when it came to raising a baby. So my father thought, well, there's got to be a better way. And so he decided to design a different type of sleeping and occasionally playing environment for the second child that came along, which was me. And so he built this large box. It had a glass front that you could lower and a glass on the other side so that it was situated next to a window and I could look out, no bars. And it was warm. It was kept warmer than 
probably normal outside ambient temperature of a room, but it wasn't closed off to germs and things. And also, I wasn't in it all the time. I would be out like any baby. I would sleep in it, and I would play in it occasionally because there would be toys in there, sometimes hanging from the roof. And it, it was a very wonderful place to be a baby. I didn't have to wear any clothes. I had diapers on, and I didn't need other clothing until I came out. Um, I, you know, when I'd woken up, my mother would bring me out and put some clothes on. But uh, it was very comfortable. I could move all my limbs very well. I wasn't constricted. So it was the perfect sort of invention for a behavioral psychologist to create. And I was always happy to be put back in again. My father said, if ever I'd objected, ever I'd start crying when, when he or my mother were putting me to bed he said that I would never put you back it was obviously a very nice place to be my sister who had two daughters used the box for both of them and at this point it was a lot more advanced it had a, um, a sort of rubberized perforated bottom to it so that uh, she could do things like give her babies um, a wash in there and keep the, the temperature up which was lovely one of the ways that they could find out if I was comfortable or not is that if I was very warm, I would be a little pink. And if I was cold, I would have my arms next to my body. You know, an obvious way to look at if anybody's cold. And, and so they could put the temperature, and it was within one or two degrees uh, of being uncomfortable and then being comfortable. And so I was, you know, I was a very, very happy and healthy baby. I didn't have all those childhood illnesses, I was very healthy. My my father claimed that I never got colds in my whole entire life, and I had to tell him that that wasn't the case. I mean, he was <laughs> sure that it was a wonderful tool for keeping a healthy baby as well as, not a tool, it's the wrong word, but, you know, a way of looking after your, your babies would be to have have them in a very nice environment when they're very young. And when you're, you're, you know, just fresh out of the womb, you're very susceptible. Right. It's lovely to where you're, you're safe as well. My sister would bring home her friends. She was six at the time to come and see the new baby. And they would lean over and breathe against the glass because the glass would be up. And, you know, it, it was winter uh, when I was still, I was, I slept in it for two and a half years, but the first winter, I think, my sister had some friends who were ill and they wanted to see the baby. And luckily they could see me very well without breathing on me. <laughs> now, um, I think some of what is largely misunderstood about it, one is that you were in and out of it all day long. You weren't left there unattended for long periods of time. Is, do you think that's something that people misunderstood? Absolutely. For one thing, my father had been putting rats and pigeons into cages, also called boxes, Skinner boxes, to study their behavior. He wanted to learn about behavior of single or, single or simple, excuse me, simple organisms. So here he was, who had a daughter that he then put into a box. And people assumed that he was sort of studying my behavior, perhaps. Neither of this is true. He, he has my mother complained when my sister was born that there was too much to do to look after a baby. And actually, it was that was the reason behind it. But, the, of course, the benefits came to the fore. And he realized how good it was for me. It wasn't just my mother that was getting off. It was a very nice environment for me. It seems to me that like one reason, another reason why it must have been misunderstood because is because there was a lot of fluidity in the way your father uh, seemed to approach behavior as it relates to many species of animals, not just rat behavior and pigeon behavior and... Uh, dog behavior, but he saw a continuum that um, the that operant conditioning is not species-specific, right? That, that 
we we are all just like we were talking about we are all controlled by our environments we're all controlled by punishment and reinforcement and whether you have two feet or four feet or four or not doesn't really um matter as far as uh the fact that we operate based on contingencies but but i think what you're saying is the goal of of the air crib um or baby tender it it wasn't that he was trying to get you to do or not do any specific things. He was just trying to design an environment that could make life safe and easier for everybody. It was a byproduct he hadn't actually thought about, I think. He really thought that if he designed something where I was warm, that meant I didn't have to have blankets on me and therefore I could move around and I was probably a lot stronger and with a baby movement is just vital and it was very good that I could move all over the place and I would lie on my back and play with the toys above me with my feet I could pull down a ring and start music playing and that sort of thing where you know it was a designed environment and people don't necessarily think when they have a baby that they want to create something that is going to be different. They, it's expensive to have something like an air crib built for you. Nobody manufactured them, but you could, you could get a pattern and then have somebody build it. But, you know, when you first have a baby, very often you don't have the money to do anything other than just buy a normal crib. Um, and a normal crib works, it functions, it just doesn't happen to be that brilliant. But the main thing, I think, about the confusion between the air crib and the Skinner box, which was studying animal behavior, was that I wasn't an on the subject. I think this is really important to make clear. And people right. assumed that he was going to study my behavior and start doing things like putting little treats into the box if I behaved it was completely ridiculous and people thought I went insane and that was because actually another psychologist at Harvard did have a daughter who was institutionalized so there was confusion about that and the fact it was also called a baby box is about bad uh, probably aspect of it as well my father he wrote an article for ladies home journal does that still exist <laughs> which was called Baby in a Box, which is why it started being called Baby Box. And in that article, he called it an apparatus, which in my mind is a very big mistake because, of course, that immediately connects it with the Skinner Box. I actually have a clip of your sister talking about that, uh, that very article. My father was very proud of it, and he sent an article off to the Ladies' Home Journal. And they were the ones that named it Baby in a Box, which said doesn't sound too good. So I thought I would show you what they further said. Debbie Skinner has lived in a soundproof, dirt-proof box since birth. And then he, it doesn't sound very good. It, it caused a lot of furor. It's like he was doing this thing to help mothers, and it got painted as uh, this evil device. And people have asked me all the you were raised in a Skinner box, weren't you? As if I was sort of put in this box when I came out of hospital, and a little while later they opened it up to find out whether they'd had a girl or a boy sort of thing. You know, the, the misunderstanding has been extraordinary, actually, and very damaging to my father's reputation. I don't care about what it says about me. I'm not anybody who needs to worry about my reputation or my contribution to um, mankind. It's my father whose reputation is important. At what point were you aware that there was controversy surrounding this thing that seemed so normal and natural to you and your family? Probably when I was in my late teens, I, it was at about that time my father started really getting talked about in his early works and became well-known. 
up until that point, he was a scientist, a professor. And I remember once I was at Harvard Summer School and I was talking to somebody, some student, and we just got to chatting and he said, you know, um, what does your father do or something? And I said, he's a professor at Harvard. And he said, what is he a professor of? And I said, psychology. And he said, is he a Skinnerian? <laughs> I thought. That was pretty good. All I said was, he's Skinner. Yes. <laughs> right, that must be pretty amazing to hear your father's name used as uh, an adjective like that. But there have been so many times when I've come across people who thought I was either dead or crazy, uh, whatever, and colleagues of my parents who would be coming back from lecturing trips, lecture trips abroad, and meeting people who said, well, it's a pity about Skinner's daughter, isn't it? And, you know, this just all, all the time, all the time it would happen that um, people would assume that uh, something terrible had happened and that it was all his fault, that he, you know, was experimenting on his daughter and, uh, you know, it doesn't bear thinking about the, the what people have imagined. Um, I mean, do do you think that the ill effects in the end outweigh the benefits to you and your mother? No. It's an interesting thought that you said you wonder whether had he done something to promote the air crib and it would therefore become better known in its own right, that that might have helped to separate two boxes, as it were. Uh, very well have made a difference that it wasn't well enough known and I think it wasn't well enough known because nobody was going to manufacture it because it was very expensive to make and we're talking about the 50s here uh, in fact the 40s I was born in 44 so in the late 40s and early 50s post-war and post not Cold War hadn't happened but fear of Russians bombing at any moment in America, uh, there was real fear of um, machine warfare. And machines had a bad name. People didn't like the automation. Then it was still a threat, I think, that women were having lots of gizmos in their kitchens and, and all this business. And people actually were revolting against technology. They didn't like all this newfangled stuff that was coming in. And I, I think the air crib would never have really taken off because I think people would have thought, why? Why bother? I'll keep my child warm. My child can walk. My child's arms and legs are perfectly strong. Uh, I think the actual benefits of the air crib overall, it's very hard to know about that, actually. Um, I do think I'm healthy. I was certainly a healthy baby. I didn't cry for a long time after I was born. In fact, my parents were a little worried because I was a little too happy. <laughs> they took me to see the doctor to ask him to do something to find out why I wasn't crying. And so he pricked me with a needle. I think he he was actually probably giving me, um, you know, a vaccine or something. And then I cried. So they were happy and I was off. It was an experiment. <laughs> I was, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think. They... Have you ever been contacted by people who are interested in, uh, in creating an air crib or in any kind of resurgence? Have you been a privy to any kind of resurgence in interest? Every once in a while, uh, it, but my sister deals with that because their first port of call would be the B.F. Skinner Foundation. My sister, uh, Julie Vargas, runs the B.F. Skinner Foundation in Cambridge, which deals with of new work on behaviorism. She's very keen, as am I, of course, to keep his books in print. And so she does ish, reissue those. She and her husband... Uh, uh, work very hard to keep his legacy alive. And 
if anybody wanted to find out how the, an air crib, they might very well be pointed towards their foundation. And you can certainly find that online. And I don't know, but I think every once in a while, I think people do make them. And of course, after a couple of years, there are a lot of these probably being put on eBay for all I know. You know these sorts of things are, you don't want to put them in an attic or <laughs> in your loft or anything. Um, there's not much room for them. They do take up a lot of space, you know. Right. What interests me about the air crib as it relates to dog training, which is, of course, my, my primary interest. I mean, and I should say, I I learned about your father through dog training. In I went to the Karen Pryor Academy and really discovered this whole world of dog training that I, I, I didn't know existed. And at some moment, I, I thought like, oh, oh, hold on. This is about more than dog training. There's a lot more here. I had heard the name Skinner, but I, I don't think I had a clear idea of who he was or what he did. I went to uh, the the flagship Barnes & Nobles in New York City, and uh, I think there was one copy of one biography about him, and I picked that up, and I read it cover to cover, and I was just, I I was blown away because I felt like, just like the kind of dog training that that we do at School for the Dogs and, and the kind of training I learned at Karen Pryor Academy, I think makes so much sense. I, I, in that same way, I felt mm-hmm. like reading his work made me feel like, oh, this this makes so much sense as a way to view the world. Um, I, 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 it's funny because since I came to it after I was already training dogs, I'm not sure how I would have thought about it prior to that, but I think dog training has made me a lot less speciesist because I see that animal intelligence is, um, it's, it, it's not one thing. Um, but I, this roundabout way of saying that when I started to learn about the air crib, as I learned about his work, I thought that's really interesting as a management tool. And in dog training, I think that so many things come down to managing the environment, figuring out what the, what the reinforcers you're going to be using are, and then delivering those reinforcers with really good timing. And the example I, I, I give to clients about the management part of that, it's like you're, you're getting to sort of create the stage on which you're, you're sort of getting to create the world in which your dogs are then going to have the opportunity to, to do lots of things you like so that you can reward those things with really good timing but part of creating that stage is also not not providing access for them to do all the things you don't want them to do because once your dog figures out how much fun it is to chew the coffee table, that behavior is going to be reinforced and then you're going to have to use punishment if you want to get rid of that behavior or you could manipulate the environment so they don't have the opportunity to do whatever the thing you don't want them to do is. Um, and when I talk about tools to sort of create that that stage or that, that dollhouse version of the world, um, the crate is certainly a big, a big one. When I talk about the crate as a management tool and I, and I saw sort of, uh, I, I saw your father's use of the air crib kind of like a crate in that you're, it's creating a very safe nice spot that your your dog can be happy in that it shouldn't be a place where they're forced to be and that when your dog is in the crate they're not also peeing on the rug or or chewing on your shoes right you're you're letting them you're you're I, I guess I would say you're training them to do appropriate things. That what, whatever you're training them to do is very broad. You're not necessarily training them to do something specific in the crate. Um, anyway, do, do you think that's a <laughs> – does, does it offend you to think about the air crib in terms of a crate? Are they happy to go into the crate? Well, I, I would try and use a crate so the dog is, wants to go in it, right? They get rewarded for going into the crate. They do. That's fine. Right. They, that means the crate to them is good. Right, right. I want the crate to be a place where they're where they're happy and safe yeah. and enjoying themselves. That's very good. Then you're not doing anything against the dog or the owner. 
Um, and if I say something about Karen Fryer, I actually worked for her in Hawaii. I worked for a summer at Sea Life Park in Hawaii. Uh, she and her husband ran a marine life center. And one of the great things about it was the way they trained the porpoises and the seals and other things. And it was a terrific place. And of course, a lot of people have seen dolphins leaping up out out of the air and things, and that's almost all done using uh, condition reinforcing a noise. How did you end up working? How did you end up working at Sea Life Park? Was that through your father's colleague? Uh, Karen, because she was using his principles, went to see him at Harvard, <clears throat> and it was sometime in the spring, I guess. Just happened to mention that the trainers are women because the men are the ones who pulls out of the tanks and they give them injections and the women are the trainers because the dolphins don't like the trainers and uh, they need to like the trainers. And my father then said, my father just happened to say, my father told her that his daughter was looking for a job this summer, at which point she offered me a job. So I went, I, I didn't do much training, but I did work with the porpoises who were being brought in and needed to get used to human contact because they were going to be put into a lagoon where they did a show with um, Hawaiian maidens. And um, But anyway, I got to know Karen, and it was wonderful. And she was using all his ideas about shaping because sometimes actually the idea of the fact that our environment is controlling us is a little strong. What the environment is doing to us is shaping us. It's making a difference to us. But it isn't so much controlling because we have some on it. But in terms of animals, of course, you shape animals. You don't start out teaching a dog how to sit by telling it to sit. You have to get it to stand in front of you. You have to then have it um, lower its behind a little bit or whatever, or if you're teaching it to shake hands, you know, you're not, not going to do it on one command. You have to shape the behavior bit by bit. It's actually called successive approximations, which means desired behavior is not immediate. It comes in steps. And I'm sure that anybody who's trained a dog to do tricks will know that it's done by bit. Right, which I think is still incredibly misunderstood. I mean, I see people all the time trying to get their right. dog to sit by saying sit as if they're, like, eliciting the sit by with the word, like the word is pulling it out of the dog or something. And pushing the dog's bottom down as if that will, because basically all the dog is doing is allowing you to push the bottom. It's not a... But I think that... If there was training going on with you in the air crib, it wasn't that you were being trained to push a lever or do anything really specific. It was just that you were sort of generally being encouraged to do lots of things that are appropriate for a baby to be doing in the same way when a dog is in a crate, he's being trained to do all the appropriate things that he's doing in there, assuming that he's happy and not crying and scratching at the crate, which we try and avoid. But more importantly... The dog, in, in the dog example, is like I said, not ha not doesn't have the opportunities to do lots of things we don't want him to do. Just like you didn't have the opportunity because you were in this enclosed environment to be to be sticking your fingers in sockets when your mother's back was turned. But we don't tend to think well, of that as training, I guess. No, I think that the air crib was purely in a very good bed, and a playpen so that I was safe in there for sure. And as a baby in a crib, they've been known to climb out of it and hurt themselves. Right. Aware of how strong they are or whatever. I was safe, therefore that was controlling my behavior to the point where I wasn't in danger. Right. But... If there were toys in there, I wasn't being shaped to play with them. Right. I, if I didn't play with them, it's because I wasn't interested. So there wasn't any, I don't see the connection. And I really, my father had very, very few thoughts about anything to do with my behavior 
but all to do with my health and happiness. Right. He was really, really to make an improvement for my mother's sake, of course, initially, but also just because the normal environment of a baby fresh from being born is to stick it in a very small surrounding with bars and an inability to be comfortable. Right. Or no way we can. If we're too hot in bed, we remove a bit of blanket. A baby cannot do that until they get old enough to move around and know that they can remove their the blanket if it's too warm. And they're too cold. I didn't have any of that. It was nothing to do with providing me with toys and trying to get me to play with them. I, I just don't see that at all. And also, I have a feeling that the only toys in there were probably the soft toys because you know you might hurt yourself if you well again i i I actually wasn't training you to do anything specific he was just trying to make you happy and healthy and comfortable and it worked obviously it worked i didn't mind going into it there was uh people learned the news at um the cinema you'd go and you see a movie and then there would be a newsreel which would tell you a bit about that and the other and they made a film that's about four or five minutes, and it started with my mother and father playing chess, and my sister next to one of them, and I was holding myself up by holding onto the table that the chessboard was on, and it was all happy families, and then I knocked over a piece, and my mother or father picked it up and put it back in the board where it belonged, and then I did it again, obviously having a good time making my parents work. And then my mother gets up, and she picks me up, and the camera follows us where she puts me into the box. Now, the air crib, I should say. She puts me into the air crib. And, of course, the immediate assumption is that that's punishment Ah. for playing the pieces. My father was so upset about that, and I don't even think he could have worked out at the time what the effect would be, because they just wanted to see me being put into the box, but it looked as if I was being punished, gave entirely the wrong impression. That's really interesting. Well, it's interesting also because there, I, I've run into that with clients where I've said if, you know, if you need to, where people perceive putting the dog into a crate as as some kind of punishment where I think, no, you're you're just letting the, you're putting the dog somewhere safe where they can can be happy. But Kind of like the air crib is misunderstood as as a box. I think crates can be misunderstood because they look like little cages. If they look, yes. if they looked, maybe actually, if they looked more like the air crib, they would be <laughs> they would be better understood. Honey, you'll lose me, and I'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone. I, I think that your father is under-recognized today. I don't think he is well enough known. I think he, I think he really should be as well known as, as Pavlov, if not Darwin, in that he showed that behavior is a factor of of evolution. I think that he showed a, a connection between learning and um, and evolution in a way that can't be stressed enough, but. It seems to me like the places where he is most appreciated now are with people who work with um, children with various kinds of disabilities, the, the applied behavior analysis uh, of the world, and in dog training, or animal training, I should say, um, and the, the whole clicker training movement. Absolutely. And I think he isn't well known. What he has taught us is well known. And it's true that perhaps it's more credit, but because it's the sort of basic fundamentals of learning, it's something you don't sit there and attribute to a person. You know, Pavlov did one thing, and it was sparked. It sparked an awful lot more. My father got on to the reaction, uh, the stimulus comes along and then you react to the stimulus. It could be 
uh, a doctor knocking your knee and your leg going out, for instance. That's a basic thing. And then human behavior beyond that. And there's an awful lot of very complicated systems to learn about the way that humans behave. For instance, gambling. Why do people put money into slot machines? Uh, is because sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. If they always lost, they wouldn't do it. And you can study the reason that they continue to put money in it. And that, all of that is, in many ways, understandable through my father's work. But you wouldn't think, ah, that's because of the Skinner, if you see what I mean. And things like, like the the use of his neat, like the token economy and things, and the autistic children who are going to a normal school after they've been at a particular school that uses my father's techniques as a reward. It's, it's remarkable. I visited one in California, uh, one of his, uh, um, I don't know if it was a student, but he started... And it was for me to see these children who normally would be kind of sitting and hitting themselves in the head, doing nothing, never really staring at anybody, being in simple tasks, they actually do that. And their reward is to go and play with um, a toy that uh, they then discover somebody else is playing with. So they, they end up having to sort of play together to get some joy out of it. And so they're being given rewards for learning the difference between an apple and a pear. And then the reward is actually in itself learning to be socialized. So there, this is pretty remarkable, and it's all down to the idea of rewarding a behavior to strengthen that behavior. And that wasn't really appreciated before my father came along. And I, I do think he should be better known, but I think it's wonderful what he's contributed, basically. And they use it in prisons, they, they use it in, in schools, of course. He did programmed learning, which I think is done now in computers, which is you learn bits of information and then you have an active answer to a question. So that you actually are actively learning. You're not just reading a textbook there, and making the, the notes. Feedback you're, is, ha is more you're immediate. You're having to ask questions. The feedback is more immediate. Yes, yes. The feed, that's good. Good way of putting it, sure. Manny, that you get feedback right away. And uh, that is a thing that he was very keen on. I found this clip, I believe it's from the 1970s, of... Uh, your dad talking about raising you and your sister, and one time where he did kind of try and uh, do some training with you. I never did use any kind of contrived reinforcing contingencies on my children. But my children, I never had a token economy, I never had a gold star point system, anything of that sort. The only exception that with my younger daughter, Deborah, I did twice shape a bit of behavior through the use of a reinforcer. When she was four or five years old, I was telling her a bedtime story, uh, rubbing her back. I was sitting on the edge of her bed while rubbing her back. And I, and I thought, well, this is reinforcing. I'll see what I can do with this. So uh, I waited until she lifted a foot, and I rubbed her back, and I stopped. Lifted a foot again, and I rubbed her back. Then she gave a great kick and started to laugh. I said, what are you laughing at? She said, when I lift my foot, you rub my back. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she, she had advanced from the animal to the human stage by that time. She, she could talk about the contingencies of reinforcement, and uh, and did. And both my both my daughters would say to me, "Don't use your psychology on us." And um, and I never uh, I never actually did. So they turned out well for perhaps the wrong reasons. So the air crib was really only one of the gizmos your father created to engineer a situation to make parenting a little bit easier for your mother, but I understand there was a, another little hack that he did to help your mom with a issue that she faced with your older sister that um, 
he thought he could make easier when she was parenting you. So maybe you can explain to me what the solution was and, well, what the, what the problem was, I guess, to begin with. The problem is you put your baby on the toilet and you don't know when they've gone. And so you pick them and you wipe their bottom and then two minutes later they pee <laughs> in their whatever. And um, because it's hard, you mean, hold on, you mean because course, it's hard to see, you mean because when they put you on the toilet, it's hard to see if you've actually peed or pooped? Well, I guess... I, that was the point, is okay. that you don't know if the baby's gone, or the little toddler, I guess, by this point. I don't know if you use that word, toddler, but if the toddler has gone, or uh, whether if you leave them on the toilet for a very long time, then uh, they get bored, and you're having to hang around, and then they've got a red ring around their bottom, or whatever. In good, it's not a very satisfactory system of toilet training. So he fixed a music box and he, he had tattooed it a little strip of paper which he put under the toilet seat. And as soon as I as I peed, the strip broke and music started to play. Wow. This is another example of my father having an idea and it ending up with a side benefit. Because instead of waiting around, I peed as soon as I got on there because I wanted to hear the music. So sometimes I think my father sort of got everything a little bit backwards. But um, the result was that I was very quickly potty trained. The only problem is that the music was the Blue Danube. So anytime I hear the Blue Danube, that's my tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Which is classical conditioning, right? <laughs> um, thank That's you. Question. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for talking. I really appreciate this. It's been so interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's absolutely wonderful the way you're you know, teaching people about dealing with their dog. Well, thank you. I think it's just terrific. And, uh, it's a high compliment. Right. Our fun dog fact of the day. Did you know that Principal Skinner on The Simpsons was named after B.F. Skinner? And our woof shout out today goes to Jose the Golden Retriever. If you live in Tribeca, you might know this beautiful, very smart dog who likes to frequent uh, the Roxy, which is a bar down there, and also the Tribeca Grand Hotel and the Soho Grand Hotel. And uh, his owner, Wendy, actually started out as a client of ours and then got so into training that she went to the Karen Pryor Academy. And whenever she's working with a particularly smart dog, a dog who picks up on things very quickly, she always says, this dog is so operant. I love that. And of course, operant conditioning was a term coined by B.F. Skinner. Special thanks to David Beckingham for his beautiful ukulele version of the Blue Danube and to Melissa Mahoney of the Channel Drifters for her version of Hello My Baby. Thanks, of course, to Deborah Skinner Buzan for taking the time to talk and to her sister Julie Vargas for helping facilitate this interview. As Deborah mentioned, you can learn more about BF Skinner at bfskinner.org which is the website for the B.F. Skinner Foundation, which is helmed by Julie Vargas. You can sign up there for their free quarterly newsletter, which is called Operants. And special thanks also to our sponsor, SaneBox. Go to schoolforthedogs.com sane and get a two-week trial as well as a $15 coupon, which you can use towards your first month if you sign up. And uh, you should sign up because it's going to make your email life so much easier to deal with. 
SaneBox is software that somehow, with some kind of magic, learns your email habits and sorts all of your emails for you. And one of my favorite features that helps me keep my inbox clean is rather than just keeping messages I'm not ready to deal with as unread, through SaneBox I can forward them to my future self. So rather than just lingering in my inbox, they reappear at a future time that I specify when I'm sure I'll be more ready to deal with them. Honestly, I don't know how people deal with their email without SaneBox, so go check it out. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, you can now support it with a monthly contribution of either 99 cents, $4.99, or $9.99 through Anchor, which hosts us. Just go to our page there at anchor fm slash dogs and hit the little listener support button. And any amount that you choose to contribute will be very much appreciated. Thanks so much for listening. You can support School for the Dogs podcast by telling your friends about it, leaving a review, or shopping in our online store. You can learn more about us and sign up to get lots of free training resources when you visit us online at schoolforthedogs.com. 